I was actually living in London in 2011 when the Arab Spring started. And of course, it started with Tunisia and then traveled to Egypt. And I remember thinking that this was it. You know, the time for change had come. And people were starting to rise up. People were starting to make demands about dignity, about human rights, about social and political change. And I wanted to be a part of it. And so I was working as a human rights defender already here in London as part of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And I decided in February to go back to Bahrain after we had already worked on promoting the 14th of February, uh, which you all know as Valentine's Day. For me, that's the anniversary of the Bahraini uprising. Um, and I decided to go back to Bahrain because I wanted to be a part of anything that happens even though I was at risk of being arrested. And so that's what I did. I packed up my bags and I went to Bahrain. And on the very first day of protests in the country, um, one person was shot and killed. And that was the fuel that basically ignited the rest of the protest movement. I believe that if someone hadn't been killed on that very first day, we probably wouldn't have lasted very long as a protest movement. And we probably wouldn't be seeing the continuation of an uprising that we are today, four years after what started in 2011. Um, now, the thing is, is that I was one of the lucky people who managed to get out of Bahrain before the severe crackdown started. In March 2011, Saudi and Emirati troops came in over the bridge from Saudi Arabia to Bahrain, and a very vast uh, general crackdown started where thousands of people were arrested and tortured. Uh, many people were sacked from their jobs. Up to 5,000 people were sacked from their jobs. Students who had liked pictures of protests on Facebook were arrested from their homes and tortured. Um, and the situation was as bad as you can imagine. Now, lucky for me, I got out of Bahrain right before that happened. And I'm a EU citizen. And so I had the option of moving back to Denmark, where I'm a citizen, and living my life just like anyone else could live their life in a country that where human rights are actually respected and where you actually matter as a human being. Why did I choose not to do that? For several reasons. One is because many of the people who were being arrested and tortured in Bahrain were people that I knew personally including my father, including my brothers-in-law, and then later on my sister, who's been in and out of prison since 2011. But there was something more to it than that. What I experienced in 2011, even though I grew up in Europe, uh, where in Denmark we had freedom of speech, we had freedom of associ association, freedom of assembly, I went to Bahrain, and in 2011, what I experienced was something I never thought possible. It was that feeling of being able to breathe again after you had been suffocated for such a long time. And it was that feeling, wanting to feel that feeling again and wanting to be a part of that movement where you are demanding your dignity from a regime that refuses to give it to you is what I think, you know, to this day when I think about it still gives me the adrenaline that I need to keep going with the fight that we're fighting. Now, one of the reasons that we focus a lot of our work here in the UK is because the largest ally to the Bahraini government is the UK government. And just last December, despite the crackdown continuing in the country, um, the UK government announced that they're opening their very first military base in the Middle East and North Africa region in Bahrain. And this is at a time when human rights, the human rights situation is deteriorating in the country where human rights defenders are either in prison or in exile or facing trial, where still if you protest, you get shot with pellets or tear gas, um, and you basically have absolutely no space to freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom of association, all of the very simple rights that in a lot of places we take for granted. But why is it that we continue to do what we do as human rights defenders? I mean, when we say that you know, Bahrain is a country that is very, very small, with a population of less than a million citizens, to think that we are taking on the UK government um, and we're taking on the US government in our fight for justice and for democracy and for human rights, it seems a bit impossible. Um, with a population like ours and with the limited resources that we have in comparison to what the Gulf countries have and what they can fight us with. So why is it that we continue to do what we do? My inspiration comes from the human rights defenders on the ground. And I wanted to share with you a very quick story before I finish off here. We've all, I'm sure many of you have read the story of the emperor's new clothes when you were a child, or it was read to you, right? And I'll give you my very brief 
version of the story. Uh, being a Danish citizen, I think I have the right to rewrite it. Um, but basically the story is that an emperor decided to have a new outfit, brought in these people to design it. And of course they designed an outfit that didn't exist. And so when they were finished and the emperor um, in all his glory went out on the streets to show off his new outfit that didn't ex actually exist, um, he walked through the streets being naked. And it was a little boy who was in the audience and because of his innocence, and probably because he was unaware of the consequences, who stood up and said, the emperor is naked. Now in our countries, in Bahrain, in Syria, in Yemen, in Egypt, in all these countries where the human rights situation continues to deteriorate day after day, where more of my colleagues are in prison today than they were in 2011. Those are people who stood up and said the emperor is naked, but not because they didn't know what the consequences were. These are people who stood up and said that the emperor is naked, knowing the consequences and deciding to do it anyway. And one of the things that we can do as EU citizens, me being one of them, is that you have something here that a lot of people don't have in where I come from back in the Middle East, and that's your voting power. You can actually make a difference in your own politics. When I meet with the FCO here, or when I hear the UK foreign minister stand up and say that Bahrain is on a path of reform, that Bahrain has made great progress, and he said this just a week ago, while my colleagues still sit in prison and while children are still being tortured, then I know that it's, I need to turn to people like you, who have voting power, who actually have an influence in UK politics, and say that, well, if you know, people in Bahrain are not being heard, it's you that can carry their voices. Thank you.